Good evening. We'd like to welcome everyone back to our services here at the Benton Church. Good to see everyone. Hope you've hope you've had a good day. It's been a been a good day. Fairly rain free so far. I think I don't think it's maybe it is raining. I don't know, but been a good day. Been a good day. Uh, just a few announcements that we need to make uh, tonight. Won't go into everything that was made this morning. Of course, remember the Pirtles as they go to Lexington tomorrow and with Nathan seeing the doctor and certainly would ask everyone to remember Nathan and Lauren and that family in your daily prayers, if you would, especially this week. Uh, and please remember Betty Stevenson also, who is in a very serious situation. She's in hospice care at Lourdes Hospital of Mercy Health, which is Lourdes. And please continue to remember Marty Johnson, Noreen, jo Noreen Jones, and Robert Stevenson, too, as they recover. A reminder, this Wednesday evening for the summer series, we will have Brad McNutt from Awana Grove Church. Look forward to hearing Brad. And then our summer youth series will be uh, July 16th, this next Tuesday, at the New Concord Church of Christ. So make arrangements to go with the, the youth to that if you would like. Our Vacation Bible School is titled Heroes for Christ, and that will be this coming Saturday between the hours of 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. Of course, we are looking forward to that, and if you can help out with that in any way, please see Nathan or any of the people involved with the youth group. I'm sure they'll be glad to take any assistance that, that you could give to them. They'll take all the help they can get, I'm sure. Uh, Sydney has told me there will be a devotional, a youth devotional tonight for the teenagers. It will be in the youth room. You feel free to go to the youth room tonight immediately following our services. Are there any, any other announcements that need to be made at this time? If not, I think Jim Kelly is leading our singing. And I'll turn it over to Jim at this time. We will glorify the King of Kings. We will glorify the Lamb. We will glorify the Lord of Lords, who is the great I am. Lord Jehovah reigns in majesty. We will bow.
Father, we're grateful for this opportunity to come here and assemble tonight and worship. We're so grateful, Father, for this Lord's Day and for the morning services we had. We're thankful, Father, for the leadership that is trying to do a better job of spreading your word in this community. And we're so thankful, Father, for their efforts. And we pray, Father, that each one here will do our part in, in making this a better place to be. We're so thankful, Father, that we are blessed with this congregation, and we ask, Father, that you'll help us to realize that we live in an evil world where sin abounds, and there are those who today attack Christianity, and we're so thankful, Father, we have the right to worship here. We're thankful, Father, that you give us your word that can transform us into being the kind of people we ought to be. We pray, Father, for the faith that we can continue to do that. We ask, Father, that this faith may be seen when times are bad in our lives, whether it be a spiritual blow or a physical blow, Father, but we realize, Father, that we have these things that we face, and we pray, Father, that our faith will help us to maintain the right course through these situations, Father, and we also realize, Father, that we can be a comfort to each other when we can bear one another's burdens. We ask, Father, you continue with us through this service. We pray it be acceptable in your sight. Through your son's name we pray. Amen. 882. <clears throat> Let's stand for the song and remain standing for our scripture reading. No tears of No tears, no tears up there, sorrow 
Scripture reading tonight will be from Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. You may be seated. <laughs> Turn in your Bible, Colossians 3, verse 15. Colossians 3, 15. Kevin's pretty excited if he only had to read one verse. People think that I pick who the scripture reader is and then find what verse we're going to do. Like if we're going to do, you know, 1 Chronicles chapter 1 through 5, where they list off all the genealogies going all the way through Adam. And uh, I haven't done that to anybody yet, you know, but that's always something to worry about, I guess, isn't it? Once again, it's good for us to be together tonight. And as we're together, we're going to talk about a subject which each one of us, I think, wants to know a little bit more about, wants to do a little bit more about it. And that's the subject of peace. As was mentioned in our prayer, we live in a world full of chaos, a world full of a lack of peace. And our country, looking at the almost 300 years, we're not quite there, but the 250, 300 years history of our country, we have been fully at peace for somewhere in a range of 41 years. And so we see that there's a lot of things going on in this world as we go back and forth and see how things go. And so it's amazing when we look at our world and see the chaos, whether it's politics, the chaos, whether it's world things going on, the chaos as far as what we see happening in families and happening in churches, and the chaos as far as what's happening within us as well. But as we get started, i got something I want to do as an illustration to talk about peace that's here and peace that we have to deal with and how we're truly going to find peace in life. So everybody, look at the person to your left. This is a test to see if everybody knows which way is left, all right? I see a lot of people looking at everybody else and seeing if they picked the right way. All right, that person who is on your left right now may look like they're still, but they're going 1,000 miles an hour. Because as you look at the spin of the world at the equator, we're not quite at the equator, of course, but the world spins at a thousand miles an hour. You never knew that person on the left was so quick, did you? Now look at the person on your right. And the person on your right is a whole lot faster. Because he is spinning around this earth right now at an average of 67,000 miles an hour. It could be up, depending on where we are on our orbit, up to 90, down to 47,000. But he's going at an average of 67,000 miles an hour right now. That's pretty quick right there, isn't it? The person on your right is a whole lot faster than the person on your left. Now, everybody look at themselves. Okay? You don't feel like you're moving. It doesn't feel like anything's happening, especially during some of my long sermons, huh? But you look and you say, man, you know, not a lot's happening right here. Why is that? Because you have a foundation. Gravity, 9.7 meters per second squared, right? That's a velocity or the acceleration, I guess is a better way of putting it, of gravity. This earth is so large with the breadth and the depth of this earth... We look around, and even though we're moving 1,000 miles an hour in an orbit, or in, a, um, in the spinning of the Earth, and even though we're moving 67,000 miles an hour in orbit, we feel like we're still. We feel like we are stationary right where we're at. That's the illustration that we're going to see in tonight's lesson. This world has chaos all around it. This country has chaos all around it. Many of our members with a lot of things happening in life right now, medically, uh, maritally, family-wise, financially, there's a ton of chaos. And when we talk about peace, we don't mean a lack of conflict. But what we do mean is that you can be rooted and stationed in Christ, and you can have a perspective to see exactly where God is and what God can do through you in the middle of what it is you're facing. And so as we look at this idea of peace ruling in your heart that we see there in Colossians chapter 3 in verse 15, in verse, yeah, verse 15, 
that's there. I want us to think about that. We're going to look at it th from three aspects. All three are important in their own way. First and foremost, I want us to get this part down. we got to have peace with God. When you and I reach the age of accountability, we're separated from God, right? Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, our sins separate us from God. The soul who sins, Ezekiel 18, 20, that soul shall die. And when we're separated from God, we lose that peace that's there. Cain, or, well, let's start with Adam and Eve. When they sinned, they were separated from the presence of God. Cain, when he murdered his brother, when he allowed anger to take over who he was, he was separated from God. When Lot chased after monetary gain rather than faith, he was separated from God. When Israel and Judah went after idols, they were separated from God. And we see throughout Scripture that those who are in sin are separate. And so we begin looking at our lives sometimes, and we realize that when we sin, and all have sinned, right? Romans 3, 23. When we sin, we're separated from God, and now there is enmity. Now we are made to be enemies or separate or against God. But that's not God's plan. And that's not where God is willing to leave you. Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have, what's our word? Peace. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. God saw our condition. He saw where we went, and he went ahead and made a down payment for our sins. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, John 3, 16, God loves you so much that 2,000 years before you were born, 2,000 years before you were ever here, he sent his son to die on the cross for you. And so our sins, even before they were committed, our sins, even before we went astray, our sins have already been paid for and been taken care of. But we have a responsibility. And that responsibility is that we must respond to God's grace. Now there's some religious groups that say you're saved by faith alone. Or they'll say, hey listen, you are saved by grace alone. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Titus chapter 2 verse 11, the grace of God has appeared unto all men. So everyone receives grace. But what does grace do? The grace of God has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, ever looking for the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have to turn to God in order to be right with Him. In James chapter 2, looking there in verse 14, What does it profit, my brethren, if a man says he has faith, if he is not active? You see, faith without works is dead. And so we have to come to God. There's no other way to find peace than through God. Jesus himself has said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. So in reviewing that section of the lesson, when you and I sin, we separate ourselves from God. We put, in our place, put ourselves in a place where there is no peace. Now, sometimes people feel like they're at peace. They sincerely follow after God. But unless you come through Christ Jesus, you cannot have peace. Jesus Christ came into this world that we might have peace, that we might have life, John 10, 10, and we may find it so much more abundantly. The second aspect I want us to look at is not only peace with God, but peace with other people, with one another. We are social creatures, and being social creatures, we oftentimes will rub one another in a rough way. Sometimes it's the words that we say. Sometimes it's the things that we do. Sometimes it's just who we are. Some people dislike other people because of the color of their skin or because of where they're from or because of a host of all sorts of different things. Christ Jesus came into this world that we might have peace. When you and I read in Ephesians chapter 2, we see a very famous passage. And it's one that we all have memorized. For by grace you have been saved through faith that is not of yourselves is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. Right? Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Oftentimes we go down to verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. Well, oftentimes when we preach through that, we miss the context of Ephesians 
because the context of Ephesians is about community. It's about the church, about why God put the church together. But we spend time on grace talking about one another individually. I'm saved by grace. You're saved by grace. That grace of God is a wonderful thing. I once was, Ephesians 2, one dead. Now I'm made alive. Why did God save us? Why did God extend grace to each and every one of us? Stay there in context. Run from chapter 2, 8, 9, 10, and now go to verse 14. Why did he save us? To make the two to become one. The Jew and the Greek are now one. To make the two to become one, the slave and the free are now one. To make the two to become one, Galatians 3.28, the male and the female are now one. We are all one in Christ Jesus. So when you work through the context of Ephesians, you see in chapter 1, verse 3, every spiritual blessing comes to all people through Christ. Chapter 2, all people are brought together in Christ. Chapter 2 and verse 14. Chapter 3, 6, we're all put together. Chapter 4, 4 through 6, the seven ones to show that we are all together. That's what Paul is trying to bring out through there. So if that's the case, then what in the world is going on with us so often? When you look at churches and you look at God's people and when you see that we can't get along, when you look at congregations of God's people and you see that there's gossip and you see that there is folks who are having trouble, why do we not have that peace? Psalm 127.1, the writer David says this, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain those who build it. And unless the Lord guards a city, they labor in vain those who try to watch over it and protect it. You and I must depend upon God for peace. Peace doesn't come from preaching necessarily. Peace doesn't come from good public relations necessarily. Peace comes from the relationship that we have with God and the relationship we have one with another. And so it's important that we pursue peace in the Lord's church, how do you pursue peace? Well, you make sure doctrinally you pursue those things which are right. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10, right? I desire therefore that all people everywhere that you speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you. It's important that we base our life, we base our doctrine, we base our worship upon the Bible. I have certain ideas, you have certain ideas, everybody in this world has certain ideas. So how do we recreate the one church? How do we be the one church which Christ died for? You read his book and you study his word. But it goes beyond just saying, okay, we're going to be doctrinally correct. We also got to have the right attitude. In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 2, Paul says, Brethren, help these two ladies, Yoda and Syntyche, these two ladies who are leaders in the church, help them to get along. Make sure that they're able to get themselves to be friends once again. You see, it's important for us doctrinally to pursue peace. But it's also important for us through love one to another to try to encourage peace within the church. In Galatians 6, 1 through 3, we are to bear one another's burdens and so pursue the law of Christ. And we must pursue peace with the world. 1 Peter 2.15, this is the will of God that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. What Peter is saying there is make your life in such a way that people can't say something against you and make it stick. Live your life in such a way that when people bring you up, they can't say, well, he's obviously a hypocrite or he obviously has this issue in life. Now, of course, none of us can be perfect. But we can all be godly as possible, and we can live blameless in Christ as we follow after him. The third part of this lesson, many years ago, I wouldn't have thought was all that important. It's important for us to have peace with God. It's important for us to have peace with one another. Thirdly, peace with ourselves. We need to learn to have peace with ourselves. I had a physics teacher, and I probably have told you this several times, at Freed Hardeman, many years ago. And he would always joke about how we were. You know, if you're in physics, you got issues in college. He'd always say, well, it's okay to talk to yourself. And he said, but you know you're in trouble when you begin to argue with yourself. And he said, then you know you're really in trouble when you lose the argument. 
That's when you really got issues. And he said, when you lose the arguments with yourself, that's when you have problems. Well, he was joking, of course. But as we look around in this world, we see a lot of people that don't have peace within themselves. And sometimes you see that through the different mental illnesses. Sometimes you see that through the different physical illness. Sometimes you see it in the way in which people face with one another, in the way in which they try to adjust things in life, in the way in which they actually try to live. Sometimes you see it in the way that they treat one another, even people who are kind and loving towards them. How is it that you and I can have peace with ourselves? Jesus in John 14, 27 said, Peace I leave with you, peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not, he says, let not your heart be troubled, You believe in God, believe also in me. Be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. 1 John 4, 4 says, He who is within you is greater than he who is in the world. All right, those are famous passages. Passages that you and I know very well. Here's a question. Do you believe those passages? Do you believe what the Word of God says about trust? Proverbs chapter 3, beginning of verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. Philippians 1, 21. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Each one of us has to make Christianity real in our heart. Now, many times we can obey God's plan of salvation. Many times we can go through the motions and be Christians. As far as showing up at church at the right time, as far as going through life and not, you know, doing the big bad sins that oftentimes we try to really highlight. But there are some times where we go through the motions... And outwardly, we look right as far as what we're doing with God. But inside, we're selfish. And inside, we're filled with doubt. And inside, while we may be in this building worshiping God, our heart is somewhere totally different because we do not have peace, because it is so difficult to trust God when it takes faith to trust God. I'm one of those people who always likes to be in control of certain situations. And let me illustrate that, because that sounds really bad, doesn't it? Many years ago, I took my youth group when I was a youth minister skiing. I got on that hill, and I started going down. I've never been a good skier, and I crashed about four times. And I hate skiing because it makes me feel like I'm not in control. It's a controlled fall, and I know it never ends well. Right? Right? That's the way I ski. It's not a pretty thing. Might be a funny thing, but it's not a pretty thing. About halfway down the hill, I took off my skis, and I just walked the whole way down because I thought, you know, I don't have enough insurance for this. That's kind of how I describe my life sometimes. When I don't see exactly where it's going to go, and when it does not completely make sense to me, I'm not going to do it. And there's sometimes when we go through life and God has made a decision that I'm going to have to step out by faith, that I'm truly going to have to trust Him, a lot of times that's when I want to argue with God and say, no, God, this is not how this works. I've done things right. You need to be nice to me. But that's not faith. And that's not how God makes us grow. And oftentimes, one of the reasons why I don't have peace, and perhaps many of us don't have peace, when we look at ourselves in this situation, is because we're not willing to be a person who walks in faith. We're not willing to take steps where it doesn't make sense to take steps. But what it means for us to be a Christian is that we will live by faith and not by sight. How much do you trust God in your life? Even when he doesn't seem to make sense. Even when he decides that he is the Lord and we're not. Romans chapter 8, looking at verse 31. What then, as Paul has gone through Romans 8, he says, What then shall we say if God is with us, if God is for us? 
Who can stand against us? What therefore shall we say? If God is for us, who therefore can be against us? Philippians 4.13, I can endure or I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Looking at this from these three aspects, what I want us to do tonight is look at our life and see where peace fits in. You know, right now I feel like I'm pretty still. Yeah, I walk around a little bit, but I'm pretty still. Even though I'm spinning 1,000 miles an hour, even though I'm flying through space at 67,000 miles an hour, I feel still because I see something. And I can trust something. And I know that something is always there. Today in your life, if you find yourself without God, know this. God is always there. Today in your life, if you have aught with a brother, if you found yourself where you don't have peace with other people, know that God has set the framework there to make the two to become one. Tonight in your life, if you're living a life that's making you have faith, that doesn't make sense, that causes you to stay up at night and churns in your belly, God is there. He is a foundation. And God has never lost an argument. And God has never lost a battle. And he's not going to start with me. And he's not going to start with you. Do you have peace in your heart? Do you know that God will take care of you? Tonight, if the invitation applies to you, if you need to obey the gospel, if you need the prayers of the church, we invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing. Have your heart that's weary, taking a load of care. Are you a soul that's seeking rest from the burning bed? Do you know?
please be seated. These young people continue to amaze us, don't they? Samuel Lanham comes tonight, and he just says, you know, I just don't feel like I have that peace in my heart, like Mark talked about tonight. And he said, I don't feel like I have the faith that I need. And for a young man that's in high school to have that feeling tells me one thing, because you can walk up that aisle and you can say that, then you do have faith. And I assured him of that, that it is his faith that allowed him to come forward to admit some shortcomings in his life. And he said he's felt that way for a few months. And I just didn't want to think about it. I didn't want to respond to it. But tonight, I want to respond to it. What a blessing and an example that is for all of us. Samuel, God bless you. We're so proud of you. And he comes with a very sincere heart and an outflow of humility, and you'll see that in him. Let us pray for Samuel at this time. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time, knowing, Father, that you hear our prayer. We come on behalf of Samuel. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with him and that you would bless him, that you would give him the strength that he needs, give, give him the perseverance to endure, and help him to know, Father, that ever since he put on Christ in baptism, as long as he has that feeling in his heart, and he's trying, Father, that that blood that was shed by Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary cleanses him daily. Help us to all have that assurance. Help us to act on our faith, to believe in our faith, and to be guided by it. And through that, Father, the peace that we talked about and listened to tonight through your holy word will inspire us, and Father, it will save us. Help us to gather around Samuel, to be a strength to him as he has been to us tonight. Help all of our young people Help them, Heavenly Father, to continue to seek you. Help them to be strengthened by their fellowship with one another. Help them to embrace your word and to be guided by it. Help us, Father, as we try to be an example to them and follow, Heavenly Father, in meaning what they, what they do for us. Continue to bless Samuel and let him walk in the light, Father, as he wants to be. This prayer we ask in Christ's holy name. Amen. If you've not partaken of the Lord's Supper, this is your opportunity to do so. Someone will assist you out back in the library. Let's sing uh, 361, Nailed to the Cross. There was one who was willing to die in my stead, that a soul so unworthy might live. And the path to the cross he was willing to tread all the sins of my life to Amen. 
I will cling to my Savior and never depart. I will joyfully journey each day with the song of my lips and a song in my heart that my sins have been taken away. They are nailed to the cross. They are nailed to the cross. Oh, how much he was willing to bear. With what anguish and loss, Jesus went to the cross. But he carried my sin with him there. We'll now have our closing prayer. Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we come tonight to worship you and sing songs of praise and glorify thy name. We hope our worship has been pleasing in thy sight. Father, we do things or say things that maybe we shouldn't do and we have, we ask for forgiveness of that, Father. May we be started week with uh, a clean shit a clean sheet of not having any sins. Father, we ask you to be with those of our number, especially with Nathan as he travels to Lexington. May he have a safe trip and a good report when he gets there and a safe trip home. Be with him and his family. Ask you to be with Betty Stevenson. She's seriously, seriously ill and be with her and especially be with her family and be with Tom Reeves, he's, he's having some health problems. Be with him and watch over him. And also be with Dr. Jim Phillips. Be with him, Father, and give him peace and comfort. Father, there's things going on in our world. There's a storm coming this way, and it's always it's already been through several states. And be with those that have been affected by it. Watch over them and, and help them, Father. Father, be with our leaders of our nation. Be with our President Trump. Be with our governor of Kentucky, Bevin. And also be with our mayor uh, of our city, Benton. Be with those that serve on city council and those that are, that are commissioners, Father. Be with them. May they all lead our country in the direction that you would have it go especially in our community, Father. Father, we ask you to be with our military and be with the, that are serving on foreign soils and also serving in the United States to protect us. We ask you to be with our sheriff's deputies and our sheriff and our policemen, Father, to give us protection. Father, we ask you also to be with our young people, especially during this time of vacation and being out of school. May they be safe. Be with them and bless them and bless their families. Father, in the end, give us a home with thee. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let's stand for our closing song and we'll be dismissed. I'm satisfied with just a kind of below a little silver and a little gold. But in that city, I want a gold one, that silver line. I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll let grow. And someday yonder we will never more wander, but walk the streets that are good as
just a pilgrim in search of a city. I